Right, thank you everybody for coming to this meeting of the Irish Astronomical Association. Um, we had numerous attempts to get a, a proper speaker for tonight, but they all seem to have fallen through. So you've ended up with some of us doing short talks on topics which we hope and think, well, we're sure we'll find in interesting. Um, so Mind that the annual general meeting is in four weeks' time. Um, anyone who wants to nominate themselves for a position on the council or to be a, an, a, an, a, an official of the council, um, get your nominations in. You need to have a nomination uh, from somebody else who's a member, seconded by somebody else who's a member, and um, there will be forms going out in Stardust which should be in the post within the next week. If you want to become a member so you can um, uh, uh, vote in the annual general meeting and throw us all out of office, do a, <laughs> a coup, then get your membership in now. Next observing sessions will be at Delamont, will be Friday, April the 5th or Saturday the 6th. Check the weather, uh, weather permitting, check the forum or um, uh, the, our uh, Facebook site at 6 p.m. on the day and the week after uh, there should be another observing session. Reminder of the 2019 Cosmos Star Party at Athlone from April the 5th to the 7th. Um, if you have a look at the, their uh, website uh, which is um, uh, shown at the bottom of that slide uh, you'll find out as much as I know about it probably more. On Saturday, the March the 30th, Earth Hour is from 8.30 to 9.30 p.m. Now, that is still uh, Greenwich Mean Time because later that night, uh, the clocks will go forwards. But um, what you're supposed to do is to turn all your lights out. Um, it's, there's more information on that um, event, which is a worldwide event at um, uh, http www.earthreminder.com slash earth hour 2019. Um, it's very much uh, an environmental um, uh, message, really, uh, statement. And it's a, it's a worthwhile event. Next lecture meeting in a fortnight's time. Uh, here will be our favorite professor, Alan Simmon, Fitzsimmons. Um, talking about DART and HERA moving an asteroid. So that, I'm sure, will be a very, very entertaining lecture, very much worth um, uh, coming to see. And, of course, we're um, indebted to um, Queen's University as a physics research centre uh, for the help in securing this lecture theatre for our meetings. OK, everybody. Um, move on to a little bit about um, what's going on uh, in the world of observational astronomy, uh, we have two spot groups. Oops, Daisy. We have two spot groups on the sun today. Um, where's the pointer on this? Top. Top. Right. Gotcha. Yes. So there's two seven three five, which has been around for a few days, developed at the weekend, and this new group, which has appeared overnight really and hasn't yet got a group uh, a, a group number but uh, so the sun's very active by the standards of this year 67% um, of the days have been completely spotless and this is the first time we've had two active areas on the sun for some time um, interestingly enough uh, the old one 2735 is a member of cycle 24 uh, the magnetic field around the new unnumbered one is peculiar so it's sort of up and down rather than left and right so it's it's really a little bit unsure as to which cycle it belongs to it's a fairly high latitude it's probably a cycle 25 spot so here is the um the graph of the solar activity over the previous year if you look for the the, the jagged red line gives you the actual number of um uh, sunspots the active the, the wolf number 
And this is what we look like for cycle 24, and you can see we're deep into the minimum. We look at the, um, the extreme ultraviolet, which gives you an idea of where the activity in the uh, corona is. You can see both of these active areas are got some loop activity, so they um, may be a little bit flare, give a, little, a bit of flare, but there's no real coronal holes, substantial coronal holes pointing at us or coming into, that's probably the next one, that's probably a bit low in latitude, it might miss us, but um, nevertheless, uh, there are still uh, the uh, aurora going on. This was taken in Sweden at the weekend, uh, most beautiful um, uh, view of the sort of aurora that get, you get when there's a crack in the Earth's magnetic field. And if we look at when there are cracks in the Earth's magnetic field, they tend to occur around the equinoxes. And this is a uh, view of the, the average number of geometrically disturbed days, which means the days when there's likely to be a, an aurora uh, in, in the month, averaged between 1932 and 2007, which is you know, a good period of time. And it's quite obvious that um, uh, uh, these geometric, geomagnetically disturbed days prefer um, uh, the equinox. And of course, we're at the equinox at the moment. In fact, uh, spring starts a few minutes before 10 o'clock tonight. So we're pretty close to the equinox. And if there is anything thing going on, then um, uh, it's more, it's more likely to get an aurora at this time, time of year than at most others. And the visibility of the International Space Station has been not visible in the evening sky for a, a few weeks now, but there's a fresh set of um, uh, passes starting in a couple of days. Um, this is from Belfast, so we can see a minus 3.2 on the 25th of March, a 27th of March, minus 3.6. Then going a bit further into the future, there's a series of um, uh, good passes of the International Space Station continues into April. Adam Jeffers has taken this most wonderful uh, image of the Orion Nebula and the associated area, uh, which is submitted to us in the last couple of days. Um, I had to actually cut the size of this thing down to get it onto the slide, so there's more information on it than that, but it really is a wonderful image. So this is the Orion Nebula and the luminosity associated with the star-forming region. And there's another piece up here, this is the Running Man Nebula. You'll probably see why it's called the Running Man Nebula. And uh, very well done in, 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 uh, indeed, Adam. Next slide. Now, I want to talk a little bit about, I'll get the illumination right down, about a part of the sky that's visible in the south um, in the late evening at uh, this time of year. So this is 10 o'clock in the evening, and we're looking out into the region uh, below Leo, and uh, to the left of Sirius, which is starting to set towards the southwest. So the major uh, constellations here uh, are um, Hydra, which is one of the biggest constellations in the sky, extends well below the horizon. Uh, Sextans, which has practically no bright stars in it at all, and you will not see anything of uh, in a light polluted environment. Corvus, which is a little bit better, and Crater, uh, which is again has very few bright stars in it. This thing here is the moon where it is tonight, and incidentally, as I was coming in, I got a good view of the full moon rising. It is a sort of uh, what they call a super moon, and it did look a little bit bigger than usual, I think mostly because it was close to the horizon. But anyway, so that's what it looks like with the, um, uh, the sticks and the labels taken off. Uh, if you look up here, um, bum, 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 yes, sorry, I'll just go back, back to that. If we look through here, this bright star, Alphard, 
is the, the brightest star in this region of the sky. It's only about as bright as Polaris, but nevertheless it stands out because there's so little else in the area. And this little pattern here is not bright, but it's only sort of third, fourth magnitude, but it is a distinctive pattern marking the head of Hydra. So there's constellation boundaries added on to it. And if we add on the star names and add on some of the brighter um, deep sky objects in this area of the sky, and you can see that there are not a great many um, uh, in the, the region of Hydra. Uh, up here you start getting the, 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 the Leo triplet and down here in Virgo, there's a huge number of galaxies and so on and so forth. The one that I want to talk about, I'll give you a little bit to talk about, is um, this uh, ghost of Jupiter, or the otherwise known as the Eye Nebula, which is not a Messier object. It's a new general catalogue, 3242. And if we zoom in a little bit, we can see where it is in relation to some of the fainter stars in Hydra and Crater and five degree view and a one degree view and it still doesn't look particularly special but if you zoom right in um, you start to get this planetary nebula uh, disk of material uh, this is an image taken of it taken with a, a 10 inch schmidt cassegrain scope that's a hubble space telescope image of it that's an image of it taken by in um, uh, ultraviolet light. And that's a Spitzer um, infrared telescope image of the Ghost of Jupiter um, nebula. The reason it's called Ghost of Jupiter is it's pretty much the same sort of size. It's very, very faint in comparison with the real Jupiter, of course. Now, another thing that happened or we found out about over the weekend is that on December the 18th, um, there was a, a fairly large uh, fireball uh, detected by um, the United States satellites that are looking for uh, nuclear testing. And this happened over the Bering Sea um, between uh, Siberia and Alaska. And this is an image that they found of the fireball actually um, uh, coming in. And this is from between 1988 and 2019. This is where all the events have been logged. And this Bering Sea event up here is the second uh, most significant one uh, that's been uh, observed since 1988. This one, of course, is the, the Chelyabinsk event. So this is 173 kilotons, which is uh, about 10 times uh, the force of the, uh, the bombs that were dropped on Japan. So it's a significant event, and if it had happened in a populated area, we'd probably heard something about it. There's no evidence that anything got to the ground, and if anything did get to the ground, it would have hit um, uh, ice, uh, sea ice, and um, uh, would probably have disappeared by now anyway. Yeah. Yeah. Down almost vertically. Yeah. The sun is shining from the bottom right. Yeah. And that was actually the shadow there of the the trail, the, the uh, sort of line trail, yeah. I suppose you would call it. So I think that's just fascinating to, yeah. to have that photo, which they find, as you say, just by yeah. chance. Yeah. Thank you, Terry. Uh, I wasn't quite aware of what that streak was. <laughs> no. Moving on from uh, the night sky and things happening nowadays, I want to talk a little bit about um, one particular uh, man who should have got far more recognition in his lifetime than he actually did. So we'll start off with talking about the Edgeworths of Mostrim. Uh, there's an estate founded in the 17th century by Richard Lovell Edgeworth. Um, this is the the house of the estate, and I think this was taken in the early 20th century. Um, there were some other notable Edgeworths, and Maria Edgeworth, who was an intellectual and writer, Michael, Michael Pakenham Edgeworth, who was a botanist, 
uh, Francis Isidro Edgeworth, who was an economist, and particular interest, Henry Essex Edgeworth, um, who was a priest, who was actually present at the execution of Louis XVI of France, and was probably the last person to talk to Louis XVI before the guillotine um, blade fell. So, um, I tried to find out where the, the Essex in this name came from, and I think it's a link to um, the Essexes who were prominent at the time of the Elizabeth I, but I'm not entirely sure. Edgeworth's town sits in County Longford, um, quite close to the border with County Westmeath. So here's County Longford, here's County Westmeath. I just got back to him in a second. Um, Edgeworth's town is a small town. Um, the area used to be called Moss Trim in Gaelic before the Edgeworths moved in. Um, got renamed during the Anglo-Irish Edgeworths period. Um, in the 1940s, the people who were in charge in the Irish Republic then reverted to the previous name, Mostrim. But in the 1970s, funnily enough, the people of the local area um, uh, decided to uh, have the town, the, the name Edgeworth's Town, reinstated. And it's now known by both names, Edgeworth's Town and Mostrim. The person I want to talk about in particular is Kenneth. Lieutenant Colonel Kenneth Essex Edgeworth, Military Cross, Distinguished Service Order. And that's a photograph of him, taken, I think, at the time of the First World War. He was born in 1880 uh, to Elizabeth Dupre Wilson and Thomas Edgeworth. The Wilsons um, uh, had an observatory at Kilsharuli, which was quite close to Edgeworth's town. And with George Minchin and George Fitzgerald, he made pioneering photometric measurements of starlight. And it's thought that uh, Kenneth Edgeworth's interest in astronomy came from um, association with his uncle. His father had a, a well-equipped workshop, and the young Kenneth built small engines, presumably steam engines, and experimented with fireworks and photography. Experimenting with photography is fine. Experimenting with fireworks is probably quite dangerous, but... Uh, <laughs> anyway, uh, when he was 17, he went up to the Royal Military Academy in Woolwich, where he was aw awarded the best cadet. Then went on to the School of Military Engineering at Chatham. Fought in the Second Boer War um, with the rank of lieutenant. Then was posted took various postings in Egypt, Somaliland, and Dublin uh, as captain. We know he was captain in 1909. World War One, he served in France with the Royal Corps of Signals, where he would receive the Distinguished Service Order, the Military Cross, and was mentioned in dispatches three times. So that's quite a significant military career. Retired in 1926 as a lieutenant colonel. Sometime during his military service, he became a member of the Institute of Electrical Engineers. After he retired from the Army from 1926 to 1931, um, he was Chief Engineer of Posts and Telegraphs in Sudan. In 1909, he, he took out or attempted to take out uh, a patent on improvements in bacteriological treatment of sewage wrote a paper on frequency variations in thermionic generators in 1926. So you see this is a guy who's got quite a broad spread to him, but you haven't seen anything yet. 1931, he returned to Ireland and set up house at Bootestown near Dublin, where he stayed for the rest of his life. Wrote several books and papers. Uh, we see here one two, three, four, five on economics, um, which were considered at the time to be progressive. And funnily enough, uh, for a man with his background, um, if you read those papers or have a look at those papers, you find they're quite strongly socialist in um, uh, as aspect. He also had an interest in uh, peat, using peat as a fuel 
wrote a paper for it in 1940, and another paper uh, book, actually in 1944, just called Turf. So he was um, probably um, involved in some way in setting up Bordenamona in the south of Ireland, who, of course, for a large part of this the last century, have um, uh, produced quite a lot of power from turf. 1965, he wrote uh, his autobiography. Of course, by this time, he was 85 years of age. Wrote his biography, Jack of All Trades, The Story of My Life, which I think gives you a fair idea of what he was about, and died in Dublin in 1972. Now, here's his real, the real interest, as far as we're concerned, the astronomical work. Very much focused on formation of stars and planets, uh, he was a theoretical astronomer rather than an observational astronomer. There's no record of him making significant observations. He was elected a fellow of the Royal Astronomical Society in 1903. It was proposed by um, his uncle, Wilson. Joined the British Astronomical Association in 1943. We don't know why. He was elected a member of the Royal Irish Academy in 1948 for his astronomical work started writing about um, uh, the outer solar system. 1938, he wrote a letter uh, in which he, found, he remarked that Pluto was too small to be a proper planet, but didn't really take it any further from that. 1939, he wrote a, a, a paper which was presented in the monthly notices of the Royal Astronomical Society on the fission of rotating bodies. So he's quite interested at this stage in how, when things are collapsing, there's a lot of angular momentum in the uh, material. Where does the angular momentum go to? Because it's not all there in a finished solar system. It's not all there in a finished star. And he was worried about that. So we think, you know, if it thing spins up, it gets spinning too fast, it'll fly apart. Gravity won't hold it together. It's an important paper he wrote in 1943 in the Journal of the British Astronomical Association, which we'll come on to in a minute. The evolution of our planetary system. 1949, he took this a stage further. The or origin and evolution of the solar system, which is a paper in the monthly notices of the Royal Astronomical Society. And he finished uh, writing up this theory in 1961 in a book, The Earth, the Planets, and the Stars, Their Birth and Evolution. Just for a uh, note here, Kuiper proposed his belt in 1951. And we'll see that um, uh, Edgeworth uh, was talking about this in 1943 and 1949. Or it proposed his comet cloud, which is very close to what Edgeworth proposed in <coughs> 1950. That's uh, seven years later. Uh, Epic had already done that in 1932. So we shouldn't really be calling it the, the Oort cloud. We should be calling it the Epic Oort cloud. Leuschner in 1907 had remarked that um, uh, most of the comets that are seen with parabolic orbits were probably not quite parabolic. They were probably very, very long ellipses. And if you work on that basis, there must be a lot of them a long way from the sun. So that's sort of a proto orc cloud, but not properly thought through. It was really epic that got that idea first. So this is the paper from the Journal of British... Astronomical Association, the 1943 paper. Um, pom, 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 pom. Yeah, yeah. Let's go on here. He's remarking that um, uh, the galaxy, the stars, solar system, the evolution of planets are not regarded as separate and distinct problems, but phases in the larger problem of astronomical evolution. In other words, they're all formed in pretty much the same way, so far as he's, he's concerned rather than being formed in separate, different ways. Well, there we go. So here's his idea. Um, you get uh, um, some material falling together. It tends to fall into a disk. And as it falls into a disk, um, the sort of friction, fluid friction, between stuff moving up and down and between the eddies reduces the angular momentum and also makes the disk thinner. Uh, the extreme example, of course, is Saturn's rings. Um, there's some 
Uh, you know, so quite, sorry, quite detailed um, discussion in mathematical terms about uh, what, what happens to these sort of things. Uh, talking about whether things, condensations as he called them, separate and become unstable and break up or condense upon themselves or form, break up and form new coalescence and so on and so forth. There are a few diagrams here. So here's things starting to come together and you must think of this thing spinning. So the whole thing's spinning this way. This is spinning this way, this is spinning this way. There's friction between those two, which reduces the angular momentum. As you come on later on, you get um, bigger bodies forming and less rubbish um, between them. Talking about the asteroids, um, uh, he's talking about how Jupiter uh, prevents the material form in the, the asteroid zone forming into larger planets and so on and so forth. And all this is very new in the 1940s. Sounds old hat to us, but it's all very new in the 1940s. Uh, here it's talking about the comets, and this is the big section, the big, the big thing here. Pum, 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 pum. Uh, must not be supposed that the cloud to scatter material which ultimately condensed to form the solar system which is bounded by the present orbit of the planet Pluto. It is evident it must have extended to much greater distances. It must also be supposed that the opacity, by which he really means density, of the cloud diminished at greater and greater distances from the sun. Since the formation of a single large planet is only possible and the opacity is not too low, it is evident that condensations formed in this out, outer region will be unable to coalesce. They simply retain their individual, individuality and condense on themselves. It may be inferred in the outer region of the solar system beyond the orbit of the planets is occupied by a very large number of comparatively small bodies. So that's the first mention of um, uh, 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 the edge of Kuiper belt. And uh, he's quite modest about himself. It is not claimed that suggested theory is final or that details may not need amendment, but his hope may, may be accepted as a plausible description of the general character of the evolutionary process. Now, one thing that's very, very interesting about uh, this is this is published in 1943. Of course, in 1943, there was a paper shortage. and There was a lot of effort um, uh, being put into publishers of journals like the Journal of the British Astronomical Association to keep things short. So he deliberately shortened that a great deal. After the war had finished, he was able to write it up at greater length. And uh, this is the paper from the monthly notices of the Royal Astronomical Society called The Evolution and uh, uh, the Origin and Evolution of the Solar System system, which goes into a little bit more detail mathematically because it's got a lot more space to play with. And this uh, this um, article extends to 20 or 30 pages. I'm not going to go through the, uh, the whole thing by any stretch of the imagination. So I'll just point out here, blah, blah, blah. It would be unreasonable to, to suppose that the original disk of scattered material came to an abrupt end outside the orbit of Neptune. There must have been a gradual thinning out of the material at the outer boundary. There's no definite ev evidence as to the opacity of this material, except that it was insufficient to, to lead to the formation of the planet. Comparing the cluster formed outside the orbit of Neptune with the asteroids, the chief point of distance difference is that the evolutionary process was much slower. The tempo of the process depends on factor T over P, and that T is the, um, the period of rotation is about 100 times greater in um, uh, the outer solar system that is in the, in the asteroids, so that the evolution is slower. It takes longer for things to condense together. Not unreasonable to suppose that this outer region is now occupied by a large number of compar comparatively small clusters, that this is in fact a vast reservoir of potential comets. So, it's worked out that um, uh, there's no need for the sort of genes model of uh, the solar system where um, uh, a close approach rip material off the sun to form the uh, solar system and it can all be done by a contraction of ga gas clouds which is very much a modern idea and it's also the reason why we expect planetary systems to be widespread in the universe. Apologies for the labels on this diagram that I lifted from somewhere else. 
uh, Edgeworth is, lift, is emitted from the Edgeworth Kuiper belt, and Epic is emitted from the Epic Ert cloud. But that's a sort of diagram of uh, the way that um, we see uh, the outer solar system these days. Of course, we didn't know about any Kuiper belt objects unless Pluto is one until we started discovering them in the 1980s. But we now know a considerable number of them. So this is a, a map of the objects uh, that we know in the solar system now, excluding comets. So in the middle here, we've got the Sun. Here's Jupiter. Here's uh, Saturn. Here's Uranus. Here's Neptune. Uh, this is the inner uh, asteroid cloud. And this thing up here is the Edgeworth Kuiper belt objects that we know about. Quite a considerable number of them. Some of them as big, or they're certainly the order of size of the planet Pluto. Some of them have been discovered which are very much smaller than that. And one of the ones which is very much smaller was the Snowman, uh, 2014 MU69, or Ultima Thule. And there's an interesting observation I would like to make about this, because recently um, there's been an analysis of some of the images that was taken as um, the spacecraft was going past uh, this object, where they've discovered that um, both elements of the um, uh, object are flattened. And if we think about what Ed Edgeworth is saying, we would expect uh, objects that accumulate slowly to be slightly flattened in some sort of way, especially when they've not got enough mass for the gravity to pull them into more spherical shapes. So um, uh, I think you'll agree that uh, our friend Edgeworth got a lot of things right, and um, his ideas are still useful in the 21st century. So thank you, Kenneth Edgeworth. I'll uh, leave it at that and hand you over to Paul, who's going to talk about Apollos 8 and 9, um, showing the way.